targeted biopsy is the future. I believe that. It, it has to do with the limitations that Dr. Liepman went over, and it really hurts to understand that we put ourselves in this position today. What we used, our diagnostic modalities, and our choices that we made as clinicians taking care of prostate cancer landed us with that grade D recommendation. I think it has a lot to do with how we, being stewards of our technology and the care of our patients, ended up in that situation. So let's get started. Before I begin, I do have some disclosures that I'll be covering during my talk. I do work with Phillips. I'm one of the lead investigators that helped develop Euronav. I also run a national PI um, for gold nanoparticle therapy, and I'm a consultant for a group with 3D biopsy. So we talked about the history of the biopsy. And if you look, we've gone digital to digital. When I was a resident, unfortunately, we didn't have ultrasound in our clinic. So we used two gloves, a straw from the biopsy needle. We cut that so we could fit the needle out and do digital biopsies. We've come a long way since then. And this was in the 1920s and 30s. The Sexton scheme, Dr. Lehman talked about it. Big was a VA study that changed the way we looked from a 6-core to a 12-core, and we found that clinical advantage of using that technology. Transperineal mapping biopsy was used for a while in the beginning with focal therapy, as well as MRI I'll talk about, and elastography. Elastography, we did do some work with this at the NIH at the same time as fusion, and we really found no difference. We found a lot more false positives when we were doing it because it was difficult for the interpretation. And that's the difficulty with that technology. What's great about it? There's no um, tracking. You don't need to have it EM tracked, optically tracked, or software co-registered. It's just the information there for your biopsy. So the targeted biopsy strategy, how do you keep from missing cancer using this approach? Well, it's important to, it's a team approach. Your radiation, or radiation oncologist, urologist, your path correlations, looking at how you're doing your biopsy and that feedback and you talk with your radiology colleagues, because if you don't know the name of your MR technologist, or not looking at MR quality, and understand the interpretation, the implications for your patients, you're not putting the effort in that's needed to make this as successful as it can be. Typically, we talked about ultrasound. How do we use it? Most urologists use it just to guide for the biopsy. We talked about the limitations in sampling, how well you distribute your cores. I can tell you when I first got my Euronav myself, I spent time tracking where I put my 12 core biopsies. And you can find that you're probably angled too far laterally, apex and base you're shying away from. So you learn to distribute your cores better by using some of these technologies. And a few of them look for these hypochoic areas. But there's a lot of hypochoic lesions. What do you do with a hypochoic lesion? I'll mention in a moment, and I'll ask you how many of you guys think that's going to be positive if you see it. But really what happens is garbage in is garbage out. You don't put the effort into your imaging, effort in to understand how the technology works. You will not be successful. We talked about the limitations of PSA-based screening, the poor sensitivity, the high specificity, which was talked about. And this makes sense. As you increase your net, net or the wider your net or you change your threshold for what you consider a positive PSA, your sensitivity can go up if you change these things. However, your specificity will be compromised because it's a give and take relationship. And this is, I think we all understand this as clinicians, we look at these types of tests. And I talked about the changes in morphology, the hypochoic lesions. 60% of the hypochoic lesions are biopsy naive. I recently biopsied a patient two weeks ago, a cardiologist. He had three prior biopsies, had a hyperechoic lesion. I'll show you a picture of his MRI, but it was hyperechoic. So it almost looked like a perfectly normal peripheral zone, but if you push on the prostate, you can see a mass effect change of the lesion there. So don't be fooled. I do think the technology that we use today can help. And this is my, probably my favorite quote. Dr. Bacala and myself were fellows at the NIH when people were throwing rocks at us when we were talking about imaging. But if you don't realize this, t just take a moment to think. Prostate cancer is the last solid organ malignancy that's still diagnosed by an indirect method of detection. There's not one other solid organ malignancy in medicine today that does not use imaging as part of their diagnostic paradigm. If anyone, can anyone think of one thing? Bone cancer doesn't count. It's a diffuse process. But besides that, anyone else? There's not one. So this should, take, this should take a moment to think that we need to change as urologists and radiation oncologists how we're looking at prostate cancer. 
What does MRI imaging offer? Hopefully improve staging, overcome the limitations of PSA only based screening. And how can we apply this new technology? There's a lot of great ways that we're taking those steps forward to be investigated to possibly change the paradigms of fusion biopsies, people do in-gantry biopsies, which never took off. Why? It just takes too long. Focal therapy is being investigated and active surveillance, and it all ends up in being individualized patient care. No one has an image like yours. That's your image. Those are your findings on your MRI. And we talk about possible indications. I think a lot of people get into this in the very beginning in patients with previous negative biopsy because that's a clinical conundrum that's hard to overcome when your patient comes to you uh, visit after visit. My PSA is still high. What do you have? I never say, well, you're just a person that has a high PSA. That's just how you live. That is not the answer. There's usually an explanation for that elevated PSA. It may not be cancer, but it's something to think about. This was mentioned, 70% of men have a negative biopsy. Um, depends on which data you look at, but between 43 and 50% of men have it. And it's a law of diminishing returns. If you, if you had a negative biopsy, doc, do I have cancer? Well, I'm not sure, but there's a, probably a 30% chance that you do harbor some disease that will detect on the next second or third biopsy along the way, which sounds kind of perplexing to a patient. You're going to say you're going to do the same poor test, and every time you do it, the de detection rate decreases from 18 to 16 to less than 10%. Essentially, you have the same odds of having cancer at your third biopsy as getting an infection from the biopsy itself. Why does this occur? I really believe this has to do with a lot with sampling and targeting. We talk about our laterally directed cores. We're not going to find an anterior lesion next to the urethra because it's going to be missed. And I'll show you another image of this a little later on. And how do we, how do we know where we've been um, and see where we are today? Emberton and colleagues spent a lot of work looking at the limitations of the truss biopsy. They use transperineal mapping biopsies as a standard because they compared the uh, prostatectomy specimens. This was a study that looked at how well you could sample in the most optimal situation, how often you can miss a lesion doing a truss biopsy. A lesion greater than a centimeter, 50% of the time almost, it's missed on truss biopsy. It won't be missed on transperineal mapping biopsies, but doing 90 or 100 cores is certainly time consuming and not as cost effective as we would like to be in our practices. But if you have an 8 millimeter lesion or 0.2 to 0.5, so it's 7 millimeters to 8 millimeter, uh, 1 centimeter lesion, you can miss almost 80% of the time. And sometimes this could be considered to be clinically significant. So what do you do? What are your options? And there's a lot of options. We've talked about it. People use nomograms to stratify a patient's risk. Should you have a biopsy or not? Different genomic tests. There's so many of them, it's unbelievable today. There's a lot of research in this field. But how much cancer do they actually have? How, what's the disease burden of your patients? None of these tests tell you what the volume or the location of the disease is. And I think that's what should take pause. That's why I think I spent a lot of time on what I've worked on, what the NIH has worked on, and other researchers looking at the idea of how can we at least get to the right location to assess these tumors? And I think that's why targeting and imaging, and almost 85, 90% of you raised your hand, and in some case you're using MR imaging to help guide therapy or screening. Historically, what did our funnel look like for prostate cancer? This is a basic visual representation, but you have your PSA-based screening. Certain men go on to have a biopsy. Some are diagnosed with prostate cancer. Maybe some of those people should be on active surveillance. Other ones that had a negative biopsy go back into your PSA-based screening profiles, and you continue on. And our goal is always to detect clinically significant disease and quantify or qualify patients they should be in maybe a treatment category or benefit from treatment. Talked about the PROMISE trial. Now, pretty much every prostate imaging talk should look at this today because this is the first level 1B evidence using MRI as a screening tool. The goal of the study was could MRI accurately define patients that should have a biopsy or should not have a biopsy. They had different clinical um, benchmarks for what was considered clinically significant at the time or what was the outcome if you used a trust or targeted biopsy approach. So we're going to work through this. Essentially, if you look, 576 gentlemen qualified as having all three reference tests. The colored side were patients with positive MRIs. They used MRI... Um, 
Likert scores one through five, so if it was three or higher, that was considered in the higher risk group or the MRI positive groups, and patients with ones and twos were considered to have negative MRIs. I personally feel if you have a visible MRI, visible lesion, that should be addressed in some way, even if it is a two. That could harbor cancer about 20% of the time. That's exactly what their data showed. So what did, what did it end up showing? And first of all, they, they took a moment and said, how bad is trust? Dr. Leitman uh, emphasized that during his talk. It's really important to understand the poor uh, specificity of the trust biopsy, or the poor sensitivity of the trust biopsy itself. And this is a, a graph, or the chart that I put up there. Dr. Leitman took the top half. That's what it's published on in the articles highlight when people discuss it. This, the MRI is in the first column, trust biopsy is in the second column, and trust biopsy has that poor sensitivity when you're looking at Gleason 4 plus 3 prostate cancer. As you change the benchmark, you can see that it does improve so, somewhat the characteristics of trust as you broaden the definitions. However, overall, MRI outperformed trust at every benchmark along the way. So where does it end up? What's the bottom line here? I think this is a really an important bottom line. We talked about the improved sensitivity, the improved negative predictive value of the MRI. The template biopsy, mapping biopsies, used as the gold standard because Dr. Emerton and Hashemed spent a lot of time comparing whole mount histopathology to transperineal mapping biopsies to say they can use it as a gold standard because you can't take out a person's prostate that doesn't have cancer. So this is the closest you can possibly get to that gold standard. But what happens if you use the scenarios that they present in the paper, an MRI, as a selection tool, plus a trust biopsies, you can decrease people's biopsy rates by 27%, and you, only, and you have 2% of clinically significant disease um, is detected. The opposite, or not the opposite, but if you add transpalatal mapping, it only has a 3% increase in the clinically significant disease, and now that is something you have to make a decision for yourself. What's the benefit of that extra 3% when you compare it to trust? It's essentially, it's a 5% difference in your patients. Now, the new funnel. The new funnel now shows you that if the patients between what center you look at, they're centered to use 1.5 T MRIs or some three Ts mixed in there. But if, as you improve the quality of your MRI, you have the increased number of negative MRIs. At my institution, I can tell you that 49, uh, sorry, 56% of gentlemen that are biopsy naive when I was at LIJ actually had a positive MRI. People had a previous negative biopsy that was 39.5%. So we're taking 45, 50% of people off the biopsy table by still detecting clinically significant disease at a higher rate than what would have been seen if you did a biopsy on all of the patients. So the funnel is changing, and I think MRI has a major impact there. So no longer um, when patients are presented with an elevated PSA, are they going to request a trust biopsy. There's a lot of options for them in the office. And I'm going to go over a little bit of the fusion biopsy, and I'm going to talk about the technology and how it works in a moment. The basic chart. This is a great chart. I feel like this chart really emphasizes the improvements or the advantages over different biopsy strategies that we've seen in the past. You can tell the 12 core biopsy. This is in the previous negative biopsy groups, how well you detect prostate cancer, and the, on the right are the ones that are based on imaging. We've compared that to MRI gantry biopsies, which is the one in the middle at 41%, transperineal saturation biopsies, transrectal saturation, and 12-core biopsies. So there is a performance advantage that we do see with adding image into the paradigm. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Mechanical localization, which is like little actuators in the truss probe. As you move it, it knows where you are, similar to your brachy set setups. EM tracking, which uses like a satellite in a car. It sees where it is in space. Optical tracking, which is what the neurosurgeons originally developed. Most of this technology is based on their work. And retrospector or computer-aided fusion, where they're able to take to an image data set and combine it to, um, with your previous data set in real time. And... Uh, those are essentially the only ways that you can do tracking today. Fusion is basically really simple. The bottom is a previously obtained MRI, and the top is a real-time ultrasound. That's the same biopsy area, uh, the same MRI that I showed you in the very beginning of that anterior tumor. You're able to now take the information, you make sure your data set's lined up, and you're able to place a needle. See the top screen? The needle goes up, it's placed right below the lesion, and then you fire directly through the target and you're able to obtain samples on the anterior portion of the prostate. There's no place in the prostate you can't go. This is from a transrectal approach. Now, 
someone's going to tell you one's better than the other. It's always the, the, best, the, the best question I get. Who should I buy from, my, which product should I buy? And these are the, this is the published data from a lot of this major series. So I'll tell you the first two are Artemis, the middle one is Euronav, 48% Coelis, and this was my series at LIJ. Now, who's better? Can you guys pick? Would you pick from this chart? Because this is what the rep's gonna show you, and it's my biggest pet peeve. This makes me more angry than anything. Because once you t figure out what the positive MRI rate is, all the detection rates for all the systems are about the same. So don't be fooled. Someone's going to sell you something and come to you and say, Dr. Rastenhad's data says that our, we're better than Artemis. And that is not correct. You have to understand is what the positive MRI ratio is. As my, the number, as I told you, 56% of biopsy naive patients were positive MRIs in my case at my institution. Imagine in the early days, they were, they were close to 80%, so they were putting patients into the biopsy pathway that probably didn't need it. So their data looks better now because they knocked off their first two years of their published data sets. Now it's come back up, and it all settles around 55 to 60%. So I think that's really important to understand that don't be fooled. If you take one thing away from my talk today is don't be fooled. Understand how the data is being presented to you. Coil, no coil. I fight all the time about this. It's always a debate. What's the coil add? Decrease in time to acquire signal, so it's faster. There's an increased signal to noise ratio. What's the downsides? Patient discomfort, your tech doesn't want to place it, and your radiologist doesn't want to deal with it, and it's an extra cost. But what's the real cost when your performance or your sensitivity is improved almost 30%? Your positive predictive value goes up 26%. I think those are significant clinical gains. I think it's something always to be considered, especially in patients that have previous negative MRIs without a coil at 3T. So it's just something to keep in mind. I mean, no one ever tells you. We're going to talk about Plato's allegory of the cave a little later on in my talk, and I feel like our, our ignorance of understanding how the, all the technology works is taken, we're taken advantage of by our radiology colleague. This is just an example of a multi-parametric MRI. There's a lot more sequences than just the three sequences that people talk about. So typically, there's 10, 11 sequences in a multiparametric MRI. But these are the workhorses, the T2, the dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, and the ADC maps. So I'm going to give a little basics background for the people that don't, so you'll just understand my talk a little better as we move through. T2. T2-weighted image, that's the anatomical. Some people argue that the difference between 1.5 and 3T, that it's Signal doesn't matter so much. I still think there's a performance advantage by a higher field strength, but you can get acceptable images with 1.5 T in an endorectal coil. Really what changes is when you have diffusion-weighted imaging. Simply put, it just, it's just how water moves. So if there's really tightly packed cells, it's more restricted. So we're able to see the uh, movement of water, and if it's more restricted, the imaging picks up on this and gives you a picture. How does that picture work? Diffusion weight imaging. Diffusion weight imaging looks at um, thresholds of restriction. Zero, the threshold is pretty much off. This is essentially T2 shine through, we call it. As you turn up the volume or the threshold, the rest, see how it gets darker, darker, and darker, but this area stays bright along the way. So it's bright, 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 still bright. This is an old slide, but the, you can see at a B750, there's a high signal there. ADC map just takes the slope of that line and creates this black dot for us urologists to be able to read this very easy. You look for the black dot on the ADC map. Does this correlate with anything? Yes. We found there's an inverse relationship with the ADC value and the detection of clinically significant or high-grade disease. And this was back in 2011. Makes sense, right? Let's get back to everyone remembers our Gleason patterns. As you have less restricted, it looks like normal tissue. So as it looks less like normal tissue, the tissue is more restricted, therefore that's how the ADC maps correlate with Gleason's score. Vascularity, some people try to downplay this a little bit. I think it's really helpful when people are learning how to read an MRI to look for the hypervascular area, especially type three focal enhancement of these curves that we use. <clears throat> but it's something just to look at all the sequence so you don't miss something. 
a lot of the times when I catch my radiologists that they've missed something, they didn't pay a lot of attention to the diffusion uh, dynamic contrast enhanced sequences. And I'm like, hey, there's an anterior tumor there, you missed that. One thing, if you guys remember, you're starting to learn this, anterior fibromuscular stroma, the top of the prostate I'll show you, if it enhances at all is, pro is cancer till proven otherwise. It's, a, it's supposed to be non-vascular, it's not supposed to enhance, it's stromal tissue, not epithelial, and if it enhances, most likely some glands have ex extruded into that from the transition zone that are now cancer. We talked about the level one evidence from the NIH, the 1,000 cases, 30% more high-grade disease, 17% low-grade, and increased accuracy when compared at whole mount histopathology, including MR fusion into the paradigm and treatment of prostate cancer. Now, the transparent biopsy I chose to talk about today because it's more applicable to radiation oncology because you use, do a lot of transparent, you know, brachy work and seed work. So I'm going to talk about this system. This was uh, I helped develop at Mount Sinai. Essentially, fusion is the basic thing. We talked about combining two data sets, the imaging and the ultrasound, and I'll show you in a moment. The basics, ultrasound and MRI are put together. Every fusion system is the same. The fonts, when we put them on the computer, slightly change today, but it allows us to guide, track, and record biopsy in 3D space. All the systems do that. What's great about this, I think this is what the future that we're going to write, focal brachy, focal therapies. Um, you can do nuclear medicine studies, develop radiogenomic atlases of what's going on inside your patient prostates. It's very exciting stuff. How how's this work? They're all based on surface rendering. This is my biggest thing. If you don't know how the technology works, you can't make it work for you. These little triangles, they just are placed over a mesh. This could be an MRI or an ultrasound. And then we match those triangles up. This is a really basic uh, graph. See all these little triangles? We're able to put them together. This is fiducial registration error and target registration error. We're able to put the two data sets together. So if you do fusion, you got to make sure you have good segmentation. If your radiologist does a poor job segmenting the MRI, you're going to be behind the eight ball on that one. If you do a poor job segmenting your ultrasound, you're not going to have the advantages of that either. So there's a lot of moving parts in these things. Again, that's the same patient with this anterior tumor that you see. You're starting just to get a little idea of how we can detect prostate cancer. I yell at everyone, look, look, look again. Before you do your procedures, you should be looking at your MRI. If you do prostatectomies, you should look at your MRI. If you do brachytherapy, you should look at your MRI and understand where the tumor is. I do cases with Dr. Stock. We talk about where the lesion is and we use that and making sure every area is covered during the case. I think that's really important. So a typical layout for a setup for the transperineal work I do, just like your brachy setup. We have a fusion machine and our ultrasound. This is me during one of the cases. This is actually a focal therapy case using the system. But you can see my tech is here, my ultrasound is here, and we're using both screens working together. What's, in, what's really nice is that you can plan. Everyone that does transperineal work understands that the pubic arches are our nemesis. And you can actually plan ahead of time outline the pubic bones, and then rock the hips to open up the uh, prostate as much as you like so you don't have to move during your procedure. And everyone, so that's something that I found helpful when I was learning how to do this. Essentially, this is an example of the screen. We're able to look at our segmentation. You check your work before you start. You look at where lesions are in relation to the prostate outline, urethra, rectum, for planning for the procedures. The basic idea of all fusion systems is we obtain an ultrasound 3D image of the prostate. Every system does it. Coelus, if you were out there, they're the only ones here. You click on the button, it creates a 3D ultrasound. That 3D ultrasound, we then create a map around the outside of it. This is just selecting the left, right, top, bottom. You click segment, it creates a 3D mesh. Remember I showed you that surface rendering? The surface rendering is from your ultrasound and your MRI, and that's how we put them together. And see, recognize this image now? We make little changes, and I think that's the important thing to understand how it works, because what's the next step? Some systems do it automatically, but I think it's important when you look at this, you see that the ultrasound image might be slightly different than the MRI, which is the purple, and there's different ways to um, make adjustments. I personally never use elastic warping unless I absolutely have to. That's the idea of taking this red line and stretching it to the green line, because the ultrasound is treated as the truth. I recommend against this 
under all circumstances. Is there a gentleman? But uh, I think it's important. But I just line up and use this live data in here, and I'll show you how we do the biopsies. Once we've lined it up, you see there's a little deformation here. Here's the rectal wall. It's not projecting well with the light, but you're able to see the biopsy needle. The biopsy needle can come in above or below this track sometimes because of deformation of the needle. I like the bevel needle so I can curve up, over, and down over that rectal hump in the beginning here. Because if you put all your pressure, so for uh, people that do brachytherapy, you guys put a lot of upward pressure on the prostate to flatten it out. Um, I try during the biopsy process and during my focal therapy, as long as there's a, a plane for my treatment, I don't want to deform the prostate that much because I think it's a lot easier to work with and you know where the structures are during the procedure. And you're able to record the information in 3D. Here's the prostate on the brachy grid. You know the places to go for the biopsy. So this is the exact same workflow. So for focal brachy, you could use a machine like this, do transperineal work, place your seeds in those areas, and understand your treatment zones. And your output, since it uses BK system, you can still use your radiation planning, but you could use, also use targeting. Now here's your difficulty. You have to use a stepper that comes with a company because it's not EM compatible because metal, those CIFCO steppers, reflect all that uh, electromagnetic tracking so it doesn't allow you to track the probe. But besides that, it's really interesting. I think we're really excited about when we have the opportunity now, if you can biopsy it, now you can possibly treat it. A little about the pitfalls. Uh, the reason I put these gentlemen up, these are the two radiologists that I worked with in the beginning of my career. We came up with this talk as a group. We sat and read every scan together for three years. We had review group every week. So we talk about it's a complex exam. There's multiple sequences. And the anatomy is variable, complex, and you can confuse it with normal structures. And I'll show you some of that. The basics of this is the peripheral zone, posterior area of the prostate. The central gland, or central zone, transition zone, depends how you use it. Radiologists use slightly different terminology than us as urologists. We would call this the transition zone, because the central zone is the area around the ejaculatory ducts that enter the prostate, and the anterior fibromuscular stroma. If you're doing fusion, any system you use, you must include the anterior fibromuscular stroma in your segmentation. I can tell you I go to centers and I help start programs for people. This is the most common area that's missed because on ultrasound, the AFM looks like it's part of the prostate. And all the segmentation tools need that information because if you leave it out, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Basics, T2, ADC. There's a little formatting there on my arrows, but here's the lesion. Pretty easy to see. It's the basics. But these things could all represent changes that could be prostate cancer or benign. And that's the problem, because prostatitis looks just like uh, prostate cancer. The biopsy hemorrhages could be, looks like prostate cancer if you make the mistake. And this whole list, I will talk about these details as we move forward to hopefully give you an idea how to overcome the limitations. Prostatitis and inflammation. The arrows are off, but see this low signal in T2? See this dark spot in ADC and enhancement? This was prostatitis, biopsy confirmed, and... Um, you can, after we treat this, these disappear, and I'll show you an example of that. Again, we have a low signal area on this with inflammation. We move through the biopsy hemorrhage. See, this is T1-weighted images. No one ever talks about that. T1 is the way we see gadolinium and also blood. So you have hemorrhage after a biopsy on both sides. This peripheral zone is actually looking normal, but for some reason, this one actually showed up to be abnormal. We waited a little while and then re-imaged and it went completely back to normal. So six to eight weeks after a biopsy is when we recommend re, um, repeating the MRI or get, obtaining the MRI for intraprostatic assessment of tumor volume. You don't have to wait for staging because that's on the outside. So I don't delay it if you want to treat your patients, but if you want the information of disease inside the prostate, it's important to wait. Metallic artifacts. I can tell when people make mistakes that there's too much air in the rectum there's this deformation. This deformation also looks like if people have metallic hips or metallic implants in their body, specifically hip replacements. This is a lesion, a small lesion in the peripheral zone. Are we starting to recognize that a little bit for the people that haven't looked at a lot of MRIs in the past? This is a low signal area. This edge doesn't line up over here because everything's been smushed over, but you see there's a little black band right there. 
that's the area that corresponds to it. But we look here in the rectum to see how much deformation there is to be aware when we're looking at the skin. This a little more uh, zoomed out view. You see bilateral hip implants. And these can affect the sequences. Not as much as the T2 or the T1 weighted imaging, but the ADC is the most vulnerable to metal and air in the rectum. If you're doing prostate MRIs without bowel preps, you're probably losing the diagnostic uh, performance of the study by people having air and stool in their rectum. I do a bowel prep, they just do a fleet set but before they have the scan. Some centers actually put a Foley catheter in people's rectums and suck out the air because that's how much it can have an impact on the quality of the scanning. Oh, so this is uh, the bane of our existence. In the very beginning, Peter Choiki, a guy that spent a lot of time training me as one of the fathers of MR imaging, he used to say he didn't believe that there's prostate cancer in the central zone because he never saw it on imaging when he first started. So you see these sharp, really sharp outlined uh, nodules. They have a, like an, almost an India ink sign. Like we talk about that black line around it. The charcoal or the loss of architecture here is what represents prostate cancer. And I think this, uh, it's very hard to distinguish some of the sequences used today to hopefully give us more insight to avoid the overcall and increase the specificity, which is the B2000 sequence, which is something where a high, very high threshold, so only the very most restricted tissues show up, helps us identify these areas. And I biopsy, I think, 40 or 50 of these peripheral zone, uh, I call them BPH nodules in the peripheral zone, Arnold Villers and myself, this is just uh, the fibromuscular hyperplasia within the peripheral zone. It's not a BPH nodule, but it has a sharp outline, areas of high signal within the, within the lesion tell us that this is a nodule. In the talks, all, the, all these are in your handout for the talk you can get online. I have put the entire pitfalls talk in there. So if you're looking for more information, it's all going to be there for you, as well as this is on my YouTube channel. So you can go see all these talks in their full entirety to cover all the pitfalls, and this is probably the most popular talk that I've ever made because it really helps you understand why the biopsy was negative. Why wasn't it positive? What went wrong? Where is the, why is there a discordance pathology? Again, this looks pretty worrisome, right? This is a positive digital rectal exam. Oh, you have a, but your PSA is normal. And you, you, a biopsy is indicated. We do the MRI. I, of course I biopsy this guy because I was worried. But in the end, this actually comes back as benign tissue. So I think it's understand that's why our DRE doesn't have that great prognostic value, just like was presented in Dr. Leitman's talk. More of these hyperplastic nodules. I show you all these because I suffered the pain of them early on. And you see how they're really sharp, clear outline. These are not prostate cancer. They're all been biopsied. Um, the... These little tissues are these low signal bands. These tiny bands like this, usually not prostate cancer. But if they're over uh, two or three millimeters, you see this thick band? This is prostate cancer biopsy proven. I think it's important to understand that these thin bands are sometimes overcalled, but you should be aware that the thick bands could be missed more often than not because they're linear. They don't seem to be a space occupying lesion, and your radiologist could just pass over this. When you start using imaging, your radiologist will be calling these as positive. They typically enhance. We call these the bunny ear sign. These are uh, stromal insertions into the prostate. They commonly are called positive lesions. And I think it's important to understand that they are not. But uh, if you look in the coronal and you see this symmetry and your radiologist has called these two areas enhancing nodules, please look in all three planes. And you're like, maybe this is just insertion into the prostate. And there, then you have a discussion here. This is common. Barris Turkbay, good friend of mine, another guy that helped train me when I was at the NIH. Lesions behind the urethra are usually not cancer. I say usually because if it's below the level of the vero, then it usually is cancer. So it takes a little bit of experience to determine when to call this positive. But again, you have this symmetry posteriorly looking in the coronal to realize it's probably an overcall for this patient. AFM, anterior fibromuscular stroma. Usually, stroma, less vascular, doesn't enhance on, on MRI. And I think this gets commonly missed. This is a large anterior tumor. It's not projecting very well on our screen today. 
but these are the areas that can also be missed, especially in patients with multiple previous negative prostate biopsies. Now, this is probably where I'm going to be ending with this. I think I'm staying on time for the most part. Predicting, MRI predicting tumor volume, there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of conflicting articles. I'm going to take you through a little um, stepwise process to see how I look at it, and maybe you'll agree with you, me, and maybe you won't. But I think it's really important because targeting um, and understanding how big of a tumor volume you have will affect how you treat your patients. It helps us with our risk stratification, helps us with surgical staging. And importantly, what I'm working on is focal therapy. So that has a big impact. So when people put papers out and say MRI doesn't work for this or MRI does, you have to ask yourself why. So most recent paper, this is from Lenny Marx's group. I've known Lenny for, I don't know, seven, eight years now working with him. Unbelievable guy. They do great work. But they came out, and I didn't agree with their conclusion. Their conclusion was that the MRI underestimates the tumor volume. Now, how does this occur? So the first thing I do is, well, Dr. Choiki, myself, Barris, Pinto, we put a paper out in 2012 that had a different conclusion. So first of all, that's a red flag goes up to me. That's why I said, why? Why are we getting different conclusions? I didn't write any text. This is literally just cut and paste from their paper. If you look at the quality of the T2 image here, you ask yourself, maybe that could be the image. That could be the reason. I think a lot of it has to do with how much effort we put into it. And when you do a paper, you usually try to put your best picture in because you want to show off how well you're doing. I've seen much better MRIs from UCLA than this, but this is the picture they chose. So you see there's a lot of blurriness to it. This blurriness is voxels of volume averaging. The patient could have moved. But this makes me think about maybe this is one of the possible causes. So let's move on to the, another paper that refuted the NIH's work and said, well, you need to put a 9 millimeter margin on the prostate MRI because it underestimates how big the tumor is by 9 millimeters. 9 millimeters is a lot. So first of all, let's look at the T2-weighted image. I want you guys to keep seeing these T2-weighted images because that's what we really use to assess tumor volume. You see it's a little blurry. It's not as sharp as some of those BPH nodule pictures that I just showed you. This was the targeted area during the biopsy, and this is what was the real, the real size. So they recommended a 9 millimeter treatment margin. A 9 millimeter treatment margin, I'm not saying, I'm not debating what we're going to do about treatment margins for prostate cancer, but I'm saying that they're extending the size of the tumor volume significantly. Why is that? I, and they say it underestimates it. This was the 2012 paper looking at the same question, and MRI underestimated tumor volume by 7%. So if you look, it's a little bit sharper. It doesn't project as well. It's a little bit sharper, but it's not as nice as you probably would like to see. But this was 2012. This is very early on. The other magnets that the people are using now are much better. So in summary, you have the NIH, which are, it overestimated by 7%, or sorry, that should be underestimated, by 7%. UCLA's paper just came out 80%, and NYU's is 14.8%. So why is this? And I want to talk about the effect of education, the lack of it on our nature. Everyone remembers Plato's allegory of the cave. We only know what we know, and we don't know what we don't know. And I think the biggest question here is, is we're, I think we're really prisoners of our radiologists. I think we're only given certain information. We accept that as truth. And understanding prostate MRI and the potential benefits for it, how do you recognize a good MRI? And I think that's what's important. Can you recognize a good MRI? And now you see the three comparisons. And now you look at this. This is our most recent MRI. Are, you really, are, you, are we prisoners of our radiologists? See the tissue definition. You can literally see the entire outline. You can see insertions of vessels. You see the heterogeneity within the peripheral zone. You see the high signal, that's probably normal. The darker areas is the prostate cancer extending through. This person had, I think it was three previous negative prostate biopsies. This is my cardiologist that came and saw me. And very sharp, very well executed exam. Now, just because you can do a good exam doesn't mean you get a good exam every time. Patients move, gas in the rectum. He was a great case. But I just want you guys to realize that when you hear people make assertions about MR imaging is that the imaging plays such a major pivotal role that radiology administrators want to shorten the time of the exam because they make more money. 
and you want a better exam because I think it gives better care for our patients. And where do we find that happy medium? So it's something that I hope you guys can take home if you're using the technology to look at the quality of the images. And then when people publish papers, please look at the quality of their images because that's going to reflect on what their conclusions are. The data is the data. No one's going to make up a conclusion that they don't believe in because they're using their data. That's the outcome of their technique. And that is the, made the largest limitation about MR imaging is the heterogeneity of the scan. Genomics is a lab test. It comes back, you have the information. Unfortunately about MR imaging, there's a lot of moving parts. And I think it's about putting that effort in to get the most out of that scan. And if you take this home, please remember that your MRIs can always look better. So in summary, target biopsy, there's level one evidence of its utility. Prostate imaging is an amazing tool, but understand the pitfalls, assess its quality of the images and your interpretation. And you must have a basic understanding of this technology to see how it works, and an extra set of eyes always helps. Please do not give care to a patient without the possible opportunity of reviewing the MRI that was done for your patient. I am a little neurotic in my practice. I look at every single MRI that I order. Just using the piece of paper, I can tell you there's discordance even with my radiologist, and I have to call and have reports addended. So I think it's important. I think it's an amazing tool, but it does take a little effort on our side. I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, please feel free. I, all my talks are online. You can download them and uh, enjoy them.